So maybe we, we, we start, I think, to this audience, uh, there's no need to introduce uh, Jean-Yves Blais. He is a, a world prominent uh, leader in the Sacoma field. He has shaped the Sacoma field immensely and has, uh, you know, together with his team, with, uh, with uh, Axel Lucen, they brought up a system in um, France, which has only, you know, the greatest tribute from our side, but uh, he's also the president of Eurocan and the World Sarcoma Network. And uh, of course, we are all very excited to have you today among us talking about the immune therapy in sarcomas. And I think we do not, we should not lose more time. Uh, we are excited to listen to you. Um, the stage is all yours, Jean Yves, please. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. The sarcoma world is a small is a small world, and I think we one thing we we appreciate in working in this world is that it's a it's a world which is extremely active and and friendly and a, a very good opportunity to work together. And this is absolutely mandatory in this um, in, in this uh, situation because the number of sarcomas that, that we have to deal with is so uh, limited that if we do not work together, we are not going to be able to solve questions. So many questions actually I'm going to, to share and discuss and, uh, um, and, and present to you were uh, addressed through collaborative approaches uh, within one country is usually not enough. We need more countries and actually we need uh, probably mo for most uh, of the tumor types that we are going to discuss, uh, a global approach and a worldwide approach if we want to be able to uh, accurately identify the right question and to provide the right answer. So these are my disclosures. What I would like to start with first is that some, is on, uh, on something which is uh, uh, quite well known and has been discussed already in previous meetings, but I think it's important. Because what we are observing now uh, in, in the field of immunotherapy of sarcoma is that it it's usually not working, at, at least single agent PD-1 or PDL one antibody, it's usually not working uh, in uh, uh, all subtypes. It's usually working in small proportion of some subtypes and uh, uh, sometimes working in a larger proportion of very rare subtypes. So in all cases, we need to have a precise classification of sarcoma and uh, at a patient level to have an accurate description of what is uh, the, the, the true nature of the disease of the, uh, of the patient. And this is very challenging because on this slide that you can't read any line, this is normal. This is a slide of um, the incidence of all sarcoma histotypes according to WHO 2020 classifications uh, in France in the network that we mentioned over a four-year period. And we have here tumors with an incidence of uh, uh, between one per 100,000 per year and one per million per year, one per million, one per 10 million, and inferior to one per 10 million. We see that a larger number of diseases that we have to deal with when we work on sarcoma are tumors which are uh, which have an incidence which is inferior to one per million per year, which typically means uh, uh, less than 50 or 10 patients per year in our countries. Uh, this is very connected to the uh, chance for us to reach clinical trial, which are um, uh, of good quality, phase two in light blue, randomized phase two in darker blue, and uh, phase three in, in, in green are observed mostly in those not so rare sarcoma. So we need to have an accurate determination first. We need to have a molecular characterization in routine of our tumors because we are going to see that this is, of course, probably quite important. And this is probably not the last level that we will need to, uh, to, to cover beyond the uh, well-known genomic alteration, which are uh, terranostic uh, in that they, they enable us to uh, classify the disease and to propose a, a treatment. This is now going to, to, to be needed because if we do not have the accurate histological classification and the ac accurate molecular classification, we will uh, probably not be uh, able to provide the right treatment. And this is particularly true in, in the field of immunotherapy, which is uh, in which we are going to deal with a small fraction of the sarcomas. And that's something which is not obvious. And we have all experienced the fact that centralized diagnosis in, in centers which have a, a larger expertise because they, they put some attention in, in this uh, perspective is something which is needed given uh, the difficulty of histological diagnosis of sarcoma. And this is not only 
important for the patient uh, because it provides the best treatment and inaccuracy in diagnosis in this case about 30% in a, in a country like France is not if not uh, reviewed centrally inaccuracy is also costly uh, at the global level at the healthcare system level it's less expensive to do well to review centrally uh, than not to review because the best treatment are going to be given first and no subsequent treatment chemotherapy surgery or whatever is going to be needed later that's very important it's less expensive to do well and, and that is of course the basis of reference center which have been uh, put forward by our colleagues from the scandinavian sarcoma group earlier on followed by our colleagues from the from the uk this is a database that i, I was mentioning the network of uh, 26 reference centers called uh, uh, called net on which it's really feasible to work together and to gather things which were uh, probably not foreseen to be feasible 10 or 15 years ago. That's a, a, a recent update of the a copy screen of, the, of our database. And I discovered, actually, I was not aware of the latest update, that we have 100, um, more than 100,000 patients with sarcoma in this database since 10 years since a bit more than 10 years actually as we uh, as, as we speak so it's feasible to organize that it's feasible and that's academic so that's basically me meant to be shared by uh, by uh, uh, everyone across uh, across all nation and to uh, uh, as discussed already with uh, uh, some of you as so something which is available to uh, for, for sharing to to, to anybody um, in in, uh, in your own sarcoma group and this is important because when we do that when we organize the management of patients with uh, uh, with sarcoma, we improve survival, and this is an independent prognostic factor. All right, so path review, reference centers are crucial for an optimal diagnosis and an optimal uh, management of patients with sarcoma. That's really the first step for the question of immunotherapy of sarcoma. Now, coming from immunotherapy of sarcoma, this is a very contrasted field if you look at the historical perspective. Because when we uh, look at the earliest uh, strategies to uh, treat cancer patients with systemic treatments in the last uh, century, actually at the end of the 19th uh, century, immunotherapy was probably among the first technique uh, uh, used to treat patients with, uh, with, with sarcoma in the form of the colitoxin. And the colitoxin was actually one of the um, the few, uh, if not the only, uh, systemic treatment active in cancer, uh, given unt uh, until the 20s, uh, last uh, l last century, and that's probably uh, uh, a, a, a very crude immunotherapy. But that was an immunotherapy which, uh, for which there was evidence of uh, of uh, activity that should have been encouraging to go for, uh, further in the development of immunotherapy. But this is actually not what happened. This is not what happened, and actually, after that, the story of immunotherapy in sarcoma has been very deceptive. We can put as a counterexample, which is not so convincing when we, when you look at the perspective of, of, of all of us experts, we probably do not have the um, the same interpretation of this study. But still, I think it's important to, re to remember that uh, uh, in osteosarcoma, the use of muramyl tripeptide, which is an immunotherapy which is probably act, uh, uh, activating macrophages, probably through a toll like receptor uh, uh, mechanism. Muramyl tripeptide uh, is able to improve, was found able in a randomized uh, clinical trial, was found able to improve uh, uh, overall survival in patients with osteosarcoma. And, and that, by the way, is the only randomized clinical trial in which a survival improvement was demonstrated in uh, osteosarcoma. As you may remember, the earliest uh, attempt with chemotherapy uh, did, did show an improvement in PFS, but not in overall survival. So this should have been encouraging, but actually very little, little happened uh, uh, afterwards. And uh, some examples uh, still followed using the uh, use of uh, um, lymphocyte manipulated to express receptors which recognize specific antigen, in this case, uh, synovial, uh, synovial sarcoma. Still, these were anecdotal uh, examples. All right. Um, what about modern immunotherapy using uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors? Um, the, the short answer is that um, the one-size-fits-all approach is not really well working. Uh, our colleagues from the um, uh, Dana Farber Cancer Institute nicely reported on leiomyosarcoma of the uterus, which is relatively homogeneous in terms of molecular alteration, or always uh, P50, P53, RB, few other alterations. But basically, 
sorry. But basically, this is not uh, um, a treatment which is which is working in the in this case. Median uh, uh, progression-free survival in the range of two months. Um, uh, within the French sarcoma group, and Antoine Italiano was the uh, uh, first investigator of this study, we uh, try to uh, combine uh, PD-1 uh, uh, antibody, pembrolizumab, with a, a cyclophosphamide low dose with the aim to uh, er eradicate the helper T cells. And basically, as we can see on GIST, UPS, LMS, and others, mostly we had no response, or at least, uh, at best, uh, a stabilization uh, of the disease. This was not very active, and it was not active, yet it met the uh, criteria for JAMA uh, on on oncology. And the same is true when we look at the data which were collected from our colleagues from the US in parallel, the SARC studies that you uh, are well aware of, the SARC-28 and the Alliance uh, uh, study, which were quite, de quite deceptive um, uh, in uh, using either single-agent pembrolizumab which provided some shrinkage, some tumor types, including undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma and uh, also the differentiated liposarcoma, but still the majority of patients do not benefit at all from this. And this is even worse for patients with uh, um, a, bone, a bone sarcoma, where uh, most of the patients did not achieve any type of uh, tumor control. The study reported by your colleagues from the uh, Alliance group, uh, uh, Sandra uh, D'Angelo, is a bit more encouraging in the sense it was a randomized study, as we all remember, nivolumab versus nivolumab plus ipilimumab. And ipilimumab, at least the combination, seems to be a bit more active uh, in uh, providing tumor shrinkage and providing tumor stabilization in a larger proportion of patients. Still, it was a complex and heterogeneous group of disease, and it was quite complicated to provide a strong signal on what could be uh, uh, the activity of this uh, uh, strategy in a, a given histological subtype of patients. Uh, in parallel, we reported also on the same study on the activity of uh, pembrolizumab plus low-dose cyclophosphamide in the bone sarcoma uh, subgroup, and basically we reproduce what was uh, done by the SARC-28, not very, uh, not very active. So, is it time to uh, get some despair? Well, probably not. Some uh, evidence have been more encouraging in the form of combination studies, uh, single arm combination uh, uh, studies with uh, um, anti androgenic agents and uh, PD1 antibodies. And probably one of the uh, first study to be reported was a study by Wilkie and collaborators uh, showing this time quite nicely that in some subgroup of uh, tumors, in this case, ASPS, uh, the, the red curve and here in light blue, uh, there were probably signals of activity of this combination, even though acetinib is not so well uh, documented in, um, uh, for, the, uh, for its use in uh, advanced sarcoma. There are some, uh, some uh, um, uh, suggestions that it, it may be uh, active, and it's also one class of agent which is known to be active in the, uh, with uh, pazopanib and uh, regorafenib. And in combination, probably uh, of interest, at least for, uh, for some subgroup of, uh, uh, of uh, patients. The second study uh, uh, exploring combination has been done by our colleagues from Spain, Javier Martin Brotto, uh, which very nicely showed uh, a combination of sunitinib and nivolumab, which was complicated to, uh, to build. There were some substantial levels of, uh, of toxicity which were observed. But here again, some levels of activity, of interesting le levels of activity, were observed in this very composite and heterogeneous group of disease. Again, a one-size-fits-all approach for all sarcoma which was, uh, of course, the usual way we do clinical trials altogether in sarcoma, and this, which is probably not such a good idea. Uh, we see that some patients do truly benefit uh, for a very long uh, period of time of, uh, of this treatment. This is the case for synovial sarcoma. This is, again, the case for uh, uh, solitary fibrous tumor and alveolar soft part sarcoma, but still, uh, how to identify best the treatment of uh, uh, the best treatment for a sarcoma patient? Uh, Antoine and uh, Sandra D'Angelo uh, tried to to address this question, putting together these studies which had put patients uh, all together in a single basket, and it provides some interesting collaborative analysis, which uh, um, which basically tell us that the uh, uh, regardless of the histotype that uh, that they uh, explored, UPS, LMS, or the diff LPS, uh, there was 
not really a strong signal in each of these individual histotypes. What was interesting to be observed is that um, alveolar soft part sarcoma still remained to be uh, um, demonstrated in the prospective clinical study, but sti still seemed to show some uh, interesting level of activity. And that was, uh, by the way, observed with all types of combination or single agent combination with immunotherapy, of immunotherapy with um, Anti-androgenics, or in combination with uh, uh, with uh, uh, cytotoxics. So, okay, uh, we have demonstration that this is a treatment which is working, but this is working probably in very rare histological subsets first, and in second, uh, in very rare sub uh, subgroups, immunological subgroups of sarcoma, which are the most common sarcomas. So how do we work from here? Which one is going to respond to immunotherapy? Well, uh, we are not so early in the field of immunotherapy and our colleagues from, in the, from the melanoma world, from the uh, non-small cell lung cancer world have uh, told us a lot of important things that there are important predictive biomarkers, which are very, um, efficient to distinguish patient population with distinct response rate to uh, to immunotherapy of course pdl1 expression at the surface of the tumor cells or of the immune cells uh, at this stage at least for uh, for sarcoma this is not something which seems to be uh, correlated a lot immune infiltrates uh, well known to be associated uh, with response in these so-called hot tumors as opposed to uh, immune excluded tumors and, uh, and cold tumors. That's something which we will see is probably going to be very interesting. Uh, muta uh, eye mutation load, yes, but okay, but our colleagues from the MSKCC has nicely shown to us that the uh, only a minority of sarcoma have uh, uh, eye tumor mutational burden, that probably less than 5% in uh, all sarcoma subtypes. And finally, something which is not irrelevant at all for, uh, in the sarcoma world, aneuploidy is generally correlated, this is in the case for um, uh, melanoma here shown, but this is observed also with uh, all tumor types in this, uh, in this study, is generally associated with uh, uh, markers of immune evasion and uh, reduced immune response to uh, immunotherapy. So can we uh, use this information and can we progress in this direction? And yes, the answer, the short answer is yes. And at the beginning of the year 2020, which was so complex by many aspects, but at the beginning of the year 2020, there were a series of papers in January, which were very interesting. Very interesting in melanoma and in sarcoma, showing uh, the importance of infiltrates, in particular B cell infiltrates, and in particular tertiary lymphoid structures, uh, in uh, being predictors to response to uh, immunotherapy. And that was a collaborative work which brought together the samples from the uh, SARC 28 uh, uh, study, also some patients from the Alliance study, and the uh, uh, patients from the uh, Pembro SARC uh, study with a combination with low dose cyclophosphamide, identifying the different groups in terms of uh, immune classification here, in terms of expression uh, profiles, different immune groups of, uh, uh, of sarcoma, which very much recapitulate what has been done um, in uh, other uh, tumor types in the bioinformatic papers, and we will quote one of these papers in, in, in a few slides, but um, uh, sarcoma with, uh, without immune reactions, uh, sarcoma with vascularization, uh, with uh, uh, heterogeneity, uh, molecular heterogeneity. You, we can see here that the histological uh, uh, classification of the, uh, the tumors do not help because we can find histological subtypes in all these different categories. Let's have a look at this category of immune and TILS infiltrated uh, 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 sarcoma. This is a category which is particularly interesting in that it provides uh, probably a subgroup of patients, which is a small subgroup of patients, with uh, uh, whose tumor are presenting with tertiary lymphoid structure, expressing therefore CD4, uh, CD3 and CD20 uh, within the uh, primary uh, tumor, and we can see here that this group of patients with uh, immune, um, so-called immune uh, uh, cell infiltrated sarcoma, are characterized by the uh, larger number of TLS. And when we look at the outcome of patients, uh, all these two patients put, put together. Uh, in, in terms of uh, duration uh, of response to uh, immunotherapy and shrinkage of the tumor, we can see that here this red group. Uh, this group of uh, sarcoma with tumor tertiary lymphoid structure seems to do not badly at all. Few here, the majority here. Of course, 
you're going to tell me and you will be absolutely right again a mixed bag and again a retrospective study so in view of that actually it was crucial to to demonstrate and to confirm that in a prospective study so uh, the study Pembrosac was modified to include only patients in the red group. So the study is not mature, has not been presented, and actually only the PI has shown the uh, uh, has seen the results. But what he told us is that indeed uh, he was able to confirm this uh, PFS and uh, also survival uh, impact of immunotherapy with anti-PD-1 on this small subgroup of patients with tertiary lymphoid structures. And actually, this is very much recapitulating what uh, others have been, uh, have been doing in the past, using a bioinformatic approach to look at uh, whether all cancer types, here it's all cancer types, it's not only a sarcoma, sarcoma here, but uh, uh, what here is possibly the, the uh, uh, the red group on, on the previous study uh, on the previous study is here the green group. They identify patients with different immune profile and immune enriched tumors uh, have a different proportion in different cancer types and possibly are related to immune response. Time time will tell. All right, so maybe we have a biomarker, so that's good, but we see also that we have only a minority of sarcoma which are concerned by this approach of immunotherapy with single agent PD-1 or combinations. Uh, that's a small sub subgroup. Is it possible to go further? And it is it possible to look at the immune landscape of soft tissue sarcoma and GIST in a different way? Because after, after all, we've been looking uh, on the one interesting tool or one interesting target, which, which is PD-1, to a lesser extent on CTLA-4, as shown by our colleagues from the Alliance study with uh, Sandra D'Angelo paper. What we did actually using this, this database that we have been built, uh, uh, we have been building in the, in the past, is to look at the expression profile of series of sarcoma in a localized uh, um, uh, uh, in a localized setting, and to see whether this was uh, it was possible to characterize them in terms of uh, uh, expression. Here, yeah, it's expression, no genomic alteration of immune uh, checkpoints. Uh, and actually, we we selected a series of uh, 90 different immune checkpoints and immune uh, gene um, known to be uh, expressed in, uh, in a variety of different disease types. We looked at them in, uh, in sarcoma in these four different sarcoma subtypes, trying to figure out if we could correlate uh, a specific profile of immune checkpoint to a specific uh, uh, histological subtypes, and whether this would be correlated to patient outcome. Interestingly, and I think that's a very important uh, observation, the immune profile of sarcoma, the immune checkpoint profile of sarcoma, I should say that better, uh, can help to distinguish the different histological subtypes of sarcoma. This, using a reduction of dimension, a TSNE approach, we can see that the uh, expression profile of uh, immune checkpoint for sarcoma with complex genomics, synovial sarcoma, GISTs, or uh, myxoid uh, liposarcoma, are completely different. And this slide is a bit hard to read, I understand that, but the point is the following. You have the color code here for the different histotypes, you have the level of expression, you have the difference according to the uh, uh, um, uh, level of expression, and you have the prog prognostic value. What you can see here it is that you have an extreme variability of expression of the different immune uh, checkpoints, at the cellular level in the different histological subtypes. Only few uh, immune checkpoints are consistently expressed or non-expressed in these samples. One of them is lag three. I will come back to, the, to that at the end of, of my presentation. Some are associated with a better prognosis, a lower risk of relapse in green, also associated with a higher risk of relapse in red. There is no consistent observation across the different of, of, of histotypes. So one conclusion from this one is that we really do not need, we must not have a one size fits all approach for the development of immunotherapy in sarcoma. We should have an approach which integrates the expression profile in the different histological subtypes. And that is very challenging because this means that we need to study TIM3, um, 
or uh, LAC3 or whichever uh, immune therapy or CD73 or 39 uh, antibodies or inhibitors um, in a given histological subtypes if we want to have a reliable uh, answer. And the same is true if you try to uh, cyber sort this signature and to, uh, to uh, look at the components of the cells which are expressed in different uh, sarcoma histotype. Again, the same color code and the same difficulty to try to get something which is uh, quite consistent. All right, I give, you, I, I give you this. The presence of macrophage, infiltration with macrophage M0 is generally not a good thing. That's probably the only consistent thing that we have across histological subtypes. All right. And going in this direction, actually, and on the view of the papers which have been published, which were interesting on the, on, in the field of alveolar soft pass sarcoma, we felt within the, uh, uh, the French sarcoma group that it may be useful to try to focus on rare histological subsets of sarcoma and to, to uh, give clinical, to propose clinical studies on these rare histological subtypes of, uh, uh, of sarcoma. And I must say, uh, uh, dear Swiss friends, that it was on the basis of one of your observation. I was extremely impressed by this publication by the team of Pierre-Yves uh, Dietrich and colleagues, which showed on, on a series of patients with cardoma significant re responses. Uh, some patients were treated with PD-1, others were treated with other immunotherapy, but at least there was signal of response. This was very much counterintuitive for us, and for me at least, because I really would have said that cardoma were not particularly infiltrated, not particularly PD-1 expressing, and not particularly uh, uh, highly mutated tumors, and yet uh, this signal of activity were observed in this very interesting study. This actually led us to build this uh, AXI immunotherapy program saying, okay, uh, we have done trials on the most frequent sarcoma histotype, let's have a focus on the rarer sarcoma histotype. That was the goal of the AXI pembrolizumab clinical study, which was a very simple uh, clinical study, um, uh, single arm, uh, pembrolizumab, usual dose, good performance status, uh, sarcoma, advanced, failing uh, doxorubicin, etc. Everything you know perfectly. Rare was a key item. Uh, we decided rare being inferior to one per million, and we tried to do the trial, uh, a trial like that with the primary endpoint, which was response rate, and the secondary endpoint, which was uh, uh, the, the classical uh, endpoints. So on the basis of these uh, observations that we had seen, the paper from Wilkie on alveolar soft pass sarcoma, the paper from the, uh, from the Swiss group on, on Cogdoma, we tried to focus on, the, on this type of tumors. And we also uh, monitored very carefully the, the data as they were coming in, uh, in showing, in particular, if we had a sign of response in one patient, and this happened, for instance, in desmosplastic plastic small round cell tumor. The information was spread throughout the group so that your next patient with a desmoplastic plastic small round cell tumor could be proposed for this approach, should he have or she have uh, the uh, inclusion criteria. We focus on rare sarcoma and try to enrich on those where we found signal. And we found, found signal for some of these tumors, so not unexpectedly we had patients of a relatively younger age. We had a large heterogeneity of patients. We had uh, uh, some interesting results in terms of duration of response because the num median number of cycle was a bit longer than usually, actually longer than the uh, uh, Pembrosarc uh, uh, study. Well, no specific questions on the uh, on side effect profile. Um, okay. One thing which is important here is that we look at the response at 84 days, that was the primary endpoint, and the PR rate and CR rate was a bit deceptive, but we did not consider that was a primary endpoint. What we also wanted to report was the best response, and actually a substantial pro proportion of patients did achieve response, but still 15% that's in the range of what we have usually and what we just showed in the uh, unselected patient population. Uh, focusing a bit on hist uh, the histological subtypes, let's have a look at the SMARC A4 mutated or all rhabdoid tumors, on epithelioid sarcoma, on cordoma, on alveolar sarcoma, sarcoma, all right, some signals of activity, at least in terms of shrinkage. Uh, interesting as a group for median progression-free survival, we are speaking here of 7.9 months, uh, with a median survival which is 19.7 months, which is a bit unexpected for this patient population. And here is probably what is the most interesting observation, this progression-free survival in the others, in purple, in alveolar soft part sarcoma, in cordoma, 
in uh, um, desmoplastic small round cell tumor and in rhabdoid tumors and with the overall survival. So clearly here we have a, a, a distinct situation where we have some signals of activity in the, these uh, studies that we report at DSMO in four different subgroup of tumors. Um, uh, some of them with shrinkage, others with prolonged progression-free survival and overall survival. Uh, actually, our colleagues from Gustave Roussy and uh, Axel did, uh, did report that published on the first observation of a patient with a rhabdoid-like uh, SMARK-A4 uh, deficient tumor, uh, which, as we all know, are extremely aggressive tumor and actually where uh, a, a, a quite impressive response wa was observed. Actually, um, as we speak today, among the six patients who, who have been included with this, uh, uh, with this tumor type, uh, three of them have responded. Uh, respond a response may be long lasting, some are shorter lasting, but things seems to be uh, quite encouraging on tumors which are so rare that probably no clinical trial would be able to uh, demonstrate anything uh, uh, if we would not have focused our attention on, on, on this one. Uh, what is interesting, but what is still under investigation, that these sarcoma are not consistently associated with PDL1 expression, ITMB, uh, cellular infiltrated. Uh, infiltrates, tertiary lymphoid structure are being in, currently investigated. But I would say that at this stage, we probably have two groups of sarcoma which deserve our interest for the future, which is sarcoma with complex genomic alteration equipped in the primary tumors with tertiary lymphoid structures, and some of these super rare sarcoma which are all inferior to one per one million per year, or some of them inferior, inferior to one per 10 million per year as incidents in all countries. All right, so what are the next steps? Cell therapy. Yes, cell therapy is very interesting. And you may remember that in the example I provided in the introduction, cell therapy was one of the interesting approach which were not so much studied some, some 10 years ago. Actually, we now have a series of clinical trials using uh, lymphocyte transfected with this, uh, uh, TCRs uh, recognizing uh, NYESO or MAGE A4 in the context of HLA A2, which report very interesting observation. This study reported in Gen Journal of Immunotherapy of Cancer investigated three, four groups of patients, uh, uh, groups of patients treated with different conditioning regimens and with different level of expression of this antigen in the primary tumor. What is important is probably this one. Uh, the conditioning regimen was either cyclophosphamide single agent or cyclophosphamide plus fl fludarabine. And why, what is quite obvious is that the combination of the two lymphodepleting, uh, the two drugs is necessary for optimal lymphodepletion and associated with a better response. But response rate here is more encouraging. Response rate is associated sometimes with infiltrates, but not always with infiltrates. Some patients do achieve an increase in uh, cellular infiltrates as they are uh, uh, responding. I interestingly, uh, in, wh when they looked at patients which were biopsied sequentially, they did not observe the loss of expression of the, uh, uh, of the antigen during the observation uh, period. Uh, uh, NY is the one, but they also look at the other antigens. Uh, and also, it doesn't seem, at, it on the, uh, at least on the period of observation, that the expression of HLA uh, or, or the expression of the antigen was lost, lost during this observation uh, period. So that's probably something of, of importance. And some of you have been, uh, may have been participating to the ongoing uh, study, which uh, is, uh, has been promoted by Adaptimmune and another one promoted by uh, GSK on NY is one and uh, uh, MAJ4A2 expressing uh, uh, synovial sarcoma. Actually, these patients are difficult to identify. Uh, I think uh, in France, we screen all together with the three centers of uh, Gustave Roussy, Bordeaux, and Lyon, we screen something like 45 patients and we are able to identify, I think, 10 patients uh, with all these, these characteristics. But at least uh, some of these patients can benefit from this treatment and treatment uh, uh, efficacy is a somewhat uh, much better than what we observe in unselected patient populations uh, test, treated with uh, uh, PD-1. 
Other combinations with dendritic uh, cell vaccination or with ipilimumab are also of interest. Importantly, it doesn't seem necessarily that the combination with uh, um, uh, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors is associated with such a, a, a large uh, increase of the specific TCR, uh, T cell uh, population transfected in, in vivo and certainly not correlated to the quality uh, of response in this population. Nevertheless, this enables us to look at the uh, impact of, uh, um, uh, of the treatment on the cellular infiltrates and on uh, circulating lymphocytes. And that's something which showed that immunotherapy, cellular immunotherapy, as some activity in, uh, in sarcoma. We would have been interested to, in, uh, to investigate further these, uh, these tools, the L this LV305 uh, dendri dendritic cell tropic lentiviral vector in patients also expressing NYSO1, because there were some evidence that uh, this approach, uh, this uh, uh, vaccine approach, did have some activity if you were able to promote uh, elicit a significant immune response. But sadly, our colleagues had to stop the development of this agent, never uh, despite of the fact that the uh, the activity was correlated to the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of the uh, viral vector. This is a bit sad, but this is. Uh, the difficulty of developing, uh, uh, developing treatment. And I think in the future, probably also uh, development of intratumoral immunotherapy in, uh, in sarcoma may be worth further exploring. So in view of these uh, uh, trials we need further exploring, let's have a look at what of the ongoing clinical trials. And many of the ongoing clinical trials actually are trying to explore immunotherapy at an earlier phase of sarcoma. Uh, maybe with the idea that it would be easier to elicit an immune response in vivo in uh, in a patient with um, with a localized tumor with less impact of uh, uh, of uh, the cancer on the immune system. So uh, several studies are investigating uh, neoadjuvant immune checkpoints in uh, uh, histological subtypes, which are either focused here in UPS and the differentiated liposarcoma, randomized between a uh, single agent PD-1 versus combination with CTLA-4, or in this case, in the RT immune protocol, where we are combining atezolizumab with radiotherapy before, after, or immunotherapy only after. Uh, the trial is, is accruing quite nicely, and we should have the, uh, uh, we should be completing the trial during the year 2021, uh, with interesting observation of activity in the new, uh, new adjuvant sub, uh, subtype. I was mentioning uh, during my presentation the uh, quite consistent expression of uh, uh, LAG3 in, uh, in uh, patients with, uh, with sarcoma in the four histological subtypes that we had investigated. Uh, again, uh, our colleagues from Bergogne had put together this interesting study, a randomized study of nivolumab plus relatilimab versus uh, nivolumab in patients with advanced soft tissue sarcoma. This is a randomized phase two, and this is also related to the observation that we made with our colleagues from uh, um, uh, from Australia that the expression of LAC3 is also associated with a, 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 a worst prognostic value in uh, several histological uh, subtypes. Finally, we are trying also to combine um, uh, immunotherapy therapy with uh, targeted treatment. So we have seen already the, the impact of combination of immunotherapy with uh, anti-VGFR2. Here in the atezogist study, which is going to start anytime soon, offered to patients failing doxorubi, I'm sorry, imatinib and, um, and sunitinib, uh, imatinib uh, only versus imatinib plus atezolizumab. Of course, this is a challenging trial, but this is a trial which was built on the observation that some signals of activity were observed with atezolizumab basket study in some patients with gastrointestinal stromal tumor, so worth exploring uh, further. At the end of the day, uh, I come back to my slide where I showed that all trials were for these patients, which are not so rare, and so, so few trials have been performed in patients with uh, the low incidence of, uh, of sarcoma. This is where we need to explore further immunotherapy in this super rare sarcoma. This can be done only through collaboration and not only national, I think international collaboration. So that's going to be the future of uh, immunotherapy of sarcoma. So immunotherapy of sarcoma, is it uh, uh, a topic? So yes, it's a topic, but it's a challenging topic because we have to be focused on the histological subtypes. Probably considering that what we, are, we have obtained now is that the ultra -rare, some ultra rare histotype and TLS positive sarcoma may be uh, worth uh, exploring further. 
Also, combination with anti-VGFR2 need to be investigated further. Certainly, TCR transfected T cell and other cell therapy are worth pursuing in patients which are by definition selected. I think new combination of ICI on the uh, on the, um, a basis of a better understanding of the immune landscape of sarcoma is also something which is uh, needed. Anyway, what is needed altogether is national networks and international collaboration. And with that, I uh, will stop here my presentation and thank you very much for your invitation and happy to discuss this uh, further and to be contradicted as well. Thank you very much. Jean, if the applause is all yours, uh, thank you very much for this detailed and very uh, comprehensive overview about the topic. Um, you exceeded once more the highest expectations. Really, congratulations. Maybe I start uh, this way before someone else turns in. Um, Jean-Yves, what do you think is the, what do you speculate about the genetic background diversity? May that play a role as well in the immune response? Yeah, I, th I, I think that's a very important point and I, I, I must say not completely, uh, not completely explored. Um, we, um, not at all explored actually. Um, There are several observations which link the uh, uh, presence of an inflammatory response in uh, a variety of cancers to the genetic background of the individual which bears the cancer. And I think these genes which are involved in these observations are probably worth investigating uh, to be investigated further in this, this project. So I know some, some projects are investigating SNP or WGS approach in... Uh, in um, in, the, in some of the trials that we have been uh, uh, mentioning. Probably, again, this is where uh, putting data together is going to be crucial. We have our WGS programs all, all, all together, which are not necessarily linked to clinical research program uh, uh, because they are disconnected. That's, that's the way it is. But um, uh, putting, putting them together in the repository would be extremely uh, informative, I guess. Thank you. Other questions, comments? May, may, yes, uh, Javier. Yeah. Congratulations, Janif. Uh, fantastic um, structure lecture. Very nice. So I, my question is, what do you think about the combination of uh, chemotherapy and immunotherapy? Because uh, maybe it's interesting to explore the immunogenic death that is related with the administration of some uh, chemotherapeutic agents. I, I, I think that's very much something worth exploring. Uh, actually, uh, we we try to uh, in the FSG we try to uh, to build some proof of concept study of combinations, and we failed to to, to be able to uh, to do that. There has been one trial of combination of trabectidine plus uh, immune therapy uh, on selected sarcoma histotype, but there were also ovarian carcinoma, which was not that much convincing, but the number were small. Um, I would absolutely love to do that uh, in a broader setting. And I, I've been saying that I think we need to focus on histological and molecular subtypes. But in this case, as you rightly point out, maybe in killing cells and having a, 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 an immunogenic cell death could make a difference. So I would love to convince people uh, or, or pharmaceutical company partners to do that. So, Jean-Yves, just one question. You think that more than the histological subtypes, more than the drug used, it is a characteristic of the tumor, the, the notion of the infiltrates cells is more is a key point for response to immunotherapy? Yeah, I, th I, I think that's the best that we have uh, so far. Uh, but uh, th this is related also to, uh, to the question of Bruno. Um, why are... are why are there five to 10% of patients with UPS with tertiary lymphoid structures? We know that patients with UPS do not have a large tumor mutational burden for most of them. So who are these guys who have TLS? Do they have TLS because they have their genomic characteristics which help them to have TLS in the case of a sarcoma? Or is it something else which is related to the tumor itself or is it both? Um, yes, I think as we speak today, I think we could be comfortable to uh, uh, to go to the health authorities and say, okay, immunotherapy is not working in sarcoma, but if you have CD20 and CD3 patterns in the primary tumor, 
then it's going to work in 50% of the cases. So please give us the drug for that. Yeah. So this more, is not more, more related to the host more than the, the tumor. I th I think that's really work work to be done. I, I I really I really don't know. I would I would guess this is both related to the tumor and to the host. Yeah. Uh, please, if you have uh, if you have ideas around the telephone or, or, or the or the camera, t tell us because frankly that's an open question for me. <laughs> Uh, excuse me, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, what about introducing calcimetostat with SMARCA uh, tumors? I uh, I understand that FDA has approved it for epitheloid uh, sarcoma. And what about ACCOHT tumor, small cell uh, tumor of ovary, the hypercellchemic uh, type? Do you have any experience of, with that, and what would be your suggestion? Um, I, I think the uh, tazemetostat. Uh, I, I know that, frankly, I do not remember uh, by heart wh what is the level of this trial. But I think there is one combination trial of tazemetostat plus, plus immune uh, plus pembro. I think, uh, which is done in uh, in variety of sarcoma type. Uh, I do not have that much experience with Tazemetosta uh, beyond that of the clinical trials so to, to which some of us are participating, which included a variety of uh, sarcoma, synovial, uh, epithelioid, and cordoma. Uh, beside epithelioid, where we had very impressive dura durable response, the impression is, uh, is not so, so favorable. But I think mm -hmm. that given the mode of action of uh, uh, Tazemetosta, this would need to be re-explored completely in combination with immunotherapy and type PD-1. Uh -huh. uh, along with the uh, PD-1, with pembrolizumab. Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I would. I, I think that would be worth exploring further. Yes, yes. Of course. Thank you. I think Laura also rose her hand. Maybe you need oh, to activate yeah. your microphone. Laura okay. Negret. Okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, any other questions? Olga? Yes, I have a question. Uh, I would like, love to know if there's any research on the efficacy of immunotherapy on patients with sarcomas triggered by microsatellite instability. Because I've known, not many, but there are some sarcomas triggered by, by microsatellite instability. Is there any research or is there the intention of a future research about the efficacy of this kind of therapy on these type of sarcomas? I, I, I must say um, to, I, there are studies which allow for patients with any tumor type and microsatellite uh, MSI uh, sarcoma mm. Uh, to uh, mm -hmm. allowing this patient to be included. And we have one, one uh, uh, study in our site, which is a local study, by the way, which enables us to give immunotherapy for this patient. Uh, I, I don't think there is a single sarcoma included so far, but I think your, your question is, is, uh, is quite logical. Um, and, and I think the knowledge on, um, of course, sarcoma are not part of the spectrum of the Lynch uh, tumor, but they are, other tumor types where probably this needs to be uh, uh, looked at further. And I think that in sarcoma, what, what, what I know is that Paul E uh, mutation were described, were described, and I think one patient was at least included in, uh, in, in the Paul E study. But uh, to, the short answer to your question is that there are no dedicated study and there is a need for that, I think. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, what about doing uh, uh, immunotherapy in patients with uh, uh, low um, lymphocyte count? I have a patient with a membrane peripheral nerve sheet tumor that uh, she's uh, uh, always uh, lymphocyte are around 500 due to previous therapy or maybe due to his uh, uh, um, reaction to tumor metastatic 
and mm. she's young, but uh, I'm wondering if I can start uh, nivolumab in a patient with uh, uh, chronic uh, lymphocyte around 500, 600. I, I, I wouldn't... Uh, when you look at the literature, it's not very consistent. There is a first paper which looked specifically at this question. I think it was from Gustave Roussy, by the way, Axel, which was not that much convincing on the value of very low lymphocyte count being negatively correlated to response to immunotherapy. They said, well, it's not very correlated. Uh, there are other experiences which uh, uh, conversely tell us that uh, the lower the lymphocytes, the, low, the lesser the, the, uh, the response in other uh, tumor type. One thing I can tell you is that we, we, we have dedicated trial for uh, MPNST. I don't know if that helps because this is anecdotal, but I, I, I mean, I was very impressed for, with this observation. Uh, a patient with MM, MPNST who had a, a lymphopenia, but not as deep as yours. Uh, she, she, I think she was uh, close to 700. Uh, she was put into a clinical trial uh, of immunotherapy and she had the most impressive response I've ever seen in a sarcoma. Actually, she, she achieved a complete response. Okay. Uh, uh, she is uh, um, mutation, tumor mutational burden for this patient is a bit high, higher than usually, it's more than 10. Yeah. But it's this 12. quality of is 12. Tumor mutation okay. burden is 12. So, so I, I would. On the basis of this anecdotal observation, I would not discourage you. <laughs> okay, and, and you will give the, the, the immunotherapy alone, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe she needs some radiotherapy in the bone metastasis. Okay, and I let you know how yeah. it goes. Uh, it, it, yeah, if you, if you have a beautiful response, tell us because understanding uh, to, to have a treatment with MPNST uh, uh, is something which is challenging. So if we can identify a subgroup of MPNST, maybe she has TLS. You have to look at that, right? Okay, we did PDL one was negative, but this doesn't mean anything for the response. Well, yeah, was you below know, one was below one yeah. percent, so it was it was uh, not not impressive. Okay, you, you, you may you may look at CD twenty and CD three, which is relatively easy to do, and uh, maybe check it out. I don't remember if we have done that for my patients. I don't remember. Okay, so you will check the, the um, sub lymphocyte subpopulation before starting immunotherapy outside clinical trial. You do it no. usually? No. No, no, we, 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 we look at lymphopenia. Usually, as we all know, lymphopenia is correlated with poor PS and uh, poor life expectancy. So we, yeah. this is okay. maybe a criteria for decision. But you also have patients who are lymphopenic and who are quite well. Okay, and we will use nivolumab. Uh, what uh, dosage would you give? Three milligram kilograms, so or the 250 fixed dose. She's 44 kilograms, so would be. I must. I must say, my experience. Uh, I will usually more, treat more patients with uh, um, uh, with Spambro than with nivo in our clinical trial mm -hmm. or uh, off-label experience. But I would do the, uh, the flat dose. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Stefan, I think it's your turn. Thank you. Um, is there any particular role and experience um, of immunotherapy for radiation induced sarcomas? Yes. Uh... Uh, no, <laughs> uh, we had some radiation-induced sarcoma in the in the Axepembro study. We were hoping that uh, radiation-induced sarcoma would have a larger tumor, tumor mutation burden for the reason we know, and may respond better to uh, immunotherapy. This, um, at least at the stage of the analysis, did not seem to be the case. Um, I would the number of patients is small, so this should not discourage further study. In particular, in view with uh, what things that we have seen, I've not spoken of that, but this is not really published yet, but the angiosarcoma of the scalp, which, are, which is related to UV exposure, um, are not so bad candidates to immunotherapy with anti-PD-1. No? Some patients do achieve some tumor control, which, are, which is quite, quite impressive, but the number are very small, and this comes from, merely from the observational studies. So um, again, short answer to your question, not, not such a, a, a large evidence so far. We have treated um, successfully one case of angiosarcoma of the uh, scalp, but we have three patients with radiation-induced angiosarcomas of the breast at the moment. So I was and wondering did, did they did, did what they you know with those. Excuse me? 
Uh, did they respond to uh, to immunotherapy? The, the I don't know the yet. I don't okay. know yet. I, I think that's very I much uh, very very interesting and worth publishing quickly because I I would suspect that this one would be would be uh, would be responding specifically this one because they are they, they do convey a better prognosis as compared to other radiation sarcoma. Um, okay. So maybe we'll let you know. We'll let you yeah. know. Okay. Jean-Yves, I have a question. Um, it seems that TLS rate remain constant or consistent over time. I mean, oh. the TLS rate is similar in locally in localized disease, locally advanced, and metastatic uh, sarcoma. Do you think if we select before surgery of a localized disease, the proportion of patients with high TLS, we can develop this immunotherapy in perioperative setting in a adjuvant situation for example ah i think that's a very interesting uh, uh, question uh, to my knowledge uh, the petit pre paper uh, which was gathering samples from all over the world and uh, the pembrosark study uh, which is currently uh, in maturation uh, analyzed mostly primary tumors uh, and some, but some met metastasis. So probably it's a it's a mixed bag. Uh, yes, but but the short answer to your question again is yes. I think that's very valuable. In the if you would have a locally advanced sarcoma with ITLS, and you want to shrink it, uh, probably a combination or uh, immunotherapy with anti PD one. Let's say it this way would be a, a nice strategy to have. But that's a small proportion. Yeah, you know. Yeah. The question is, do you think it is the same patient who respond to docs or docs or chemo, docs or yeah. info combination or chemotherapy regimen? Or but today we don't know. We have no predictive factors except in Absolutely. some, even for chemotherapy, immunotherapy, uh, anti antigenic agents. Yes, yes, absolutely. Are these the same patients that do respond to doxorifos? Yeah, nobody knows, I think. That would not be unlogical, huh? Yeah. It was the same. Yeah. Dr. Pravasimovic, uh, I um, have been here. I wanted to ask about the copy number alteration. Do you have a standardized uh, report and the threshold to decide on the immunotherapy based on that in sarcoma? Uh, no, no, we, we don't. Actually, uh, the, the study I mentioned was a study which was uh, reported in Nature, I think. Uh, but this is not being used as a, with a threshold. Actually, they observe that uh, uh, the larger number of copy number alteration, the more um, uh, losses and gains, the lower the response. That was the observation of the study. But they did not, uh, it, uh, at least, uh, they did not identify a level to my, to my, uh, in my recollection. So in the in the clinical practice, it's uh, difficult to, to use. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't think we can use it. Any further questions? Any concluding remark uh, from Axel and uh, Javier Martin? No, I then, think uh, it's uh, very, very well addressed uh, the topic and uh, in a deeply way. So I think uh, we are in the embryonary phase of immunotherapy in sarcoma because maybe uh, lymphocyte, uh, T lymphocyte, T cell lymphocyte is not the most important um, cell in the microenvironment. Maybe as uh, Janice mentioned, uh, B cells or even macrophages can be even more important in the response in, in the context of sarcoma. And also in cell therapy, which is very um, helpful uh, treatment, uh, we are in the, in, in the very embryonary phase. Maybe uh, we are not selecting the patients uh, as, uh, as the best way, because maybe in an early phase is more uh, effective, this uh, approach. But um, we, we need to, to go forward and to, to make uh, correlative studies with uh, relational research in order to know, be to better know how is, um, what is the best predictive um, um, biomarkers for, for immunotherapy. 
And uh, as you know, the sarcoma field is a very heterogeneous uh, field, so we have to to make um, more homogeneous selection in the in the patients um, accrual. So I think it's a very um, interesting uh, field, uh, and we need to to go forward. Uh, we are in the very very embryonary phase, I think. So high expectancy um, ahead. <laughs> Completely agree. Well, uh, thank you very much.